Please welcome Professor Paul D'Souza. Thank you very much. Um, it's, uh, I'd like to thank the organisers for inviting me to speak today. I'm very happy to take questions, you know, afterwards or even in the middle of uh, my talk. Um, and <clears throat> what I'm going to talk today is briefly a little bit about survivorship and what my practical take on some of the issues are from a patient perspective. Um, so. Survivorship is a relatively new idea in cancer research um, and in the literature it's the, the studies and the research has been growing exponentially over the last five or ten years or so. It's not an area that I'm familiar with so um, this stuff is just all made up from my perspective. Um, but um, the, meaning, the meaning of survivorship in, in the literature is that anything that happens after the diagnosis of cancer, um, anything at all, I kind of have a little bit more restricted idea of survivorship and that is the post-treatment phase really um, when patients have time to think about things and reflect on things. So um, to my uninformed way of thinking about things, my perception is that patients and their families really have three sorts of phases that they undergo um, during the course of, of a can their cancer fight, their cancer journey, so called. Um, first of all, I call it the rally, then the fight, and then the uncertainty. Now, patients do sometimes skip a stage, in my experience, or they never progress. Um, and they're stuck in the rally or the fight. Um, and they can also regress as well, depending on what sorts of supports um, that they have behind them, their families and friends and, and, and even their doctors as well. So what do I mean by that? Well, the rally is a period where there's the initial reaction from anything from initial shock to the news of the diagnosis to outright denial. Now, I'm not using this as a psychological term, which has got a specific meaning, a psychiatric term. I'm just referring to the, to the reaction where it's not happening to me, I don't believe it, there's something wrong, um, I feel perfectly well. Um, and this period also includes a period where family and friends discuss the, the diagnosis. Um, often there's, there's, there's a gathering around a, and, and a rally, if you like. Sometimes daughters or sons are dispatched to the internet um, and that's where a lot of the research and a lot of background, a lot of reading is done. Um, and what I've noticed is that some, in some families, teams are formed. So um, friends deliver the patients to the clinic, deliver the patients to the appointment, accompany them to, to the doctor's office as well and sit in with a consultation as well. And um, more remotely, often busy sons or daughters who are at work but busy on the internet often, looking up stuff, suggesting treatments, looking for second opinions and so on, often in the background. But sometimes they also turn up to, to, to the appointment as well. And then treatment decisions are made regardless of what that is, whether it's surgery, radiation or chemotherapy and so on. And then patients, I think, go through a period of the fight. And this is essentially around a period of treatment. So sometimes this is very short and sharp, just surgery alone, for example, or surgery and radiation over a period of about eight weeks. Or if women with breast cancer, for example, have chemotherapy, it might be a period of nine months after the diagnosis during which this, this happens. And during this, sorts of questions um, that I get and uh, occur around the duration of treatment, side effects, whether they're responding to treatment. Um, and psychologically, I think this is also a period of respite. So for patients that pass over the period of the rally, they then have a bit of a rest and a time to, to reflect what's going on despite the ongoing treatment, despite the the hassles despite the commitment and despite the side effects and the fatigue. Um, for some who have time, some longer term planning, um, 
for example, often I find that patients have a target at the end of their chemotherapy, for example, they'll go overseas. It's a, it's a long promised trip. Or their children will say, look, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll go somewhere. Um, and this is a common sort of reaction. Um, it's also a time where I, this may be a bit harsh, but I call it unproven therapies, where as part of the research and as part of the questioning about the diagnosis and their treatments, sometimes patients will go on to um, so-called complementary therapies uh, with or without the knowledge of, of their treating doctors. And then the period of uncertainty is post treatment. After the flurry of the, the, the rally and the fight is over, you know, um, patients are, s are coming back for their follow-up appointments and they still have more questions. Often that's, that's the real period of questioning, introspection and reflection. Um, and at that point, um, there may be varying stages of anxiety, anger sometimes. Why did this happen to me? I've always been a vegetarian for the for all of my life, you know, I've, I've never smoked, I've never drunk, why have I got this cancer? Um, and then sometimes some depression as well, and this might be very subtle or, or sub, subclinical, and there may not be any need to see anyone or, or go into any treatment, but it, it's there. But also a period of uh, positiveness as well, because they've been through the fight, and now they're sort of getting to some back to some semblance of normal life as well. Um, and there's a sense of peace and, and a sense of control as well. For, for patients that don't do so well and they're on chemotherapy and things are clearly getting worse, um, there's also sometimes an acceptance of what is going to happen as well. So there's ongoing fatigue often, guilt sometimes, um, a year or two or ten years later, especially um, patients with breast cancer, for example, that I see on, on follow-up, they're eight years down the track. Their friend who had breast cancer is dying of breast cancer. Um, they had it diagnosed at the same time. So there's this sort of questioning about why me or why her? Um, and there's a sort of sense of guilt as well because of the fact that they see someone else doing not so well. Um, again, there's also the positive aspects. Um, Valuing relationships, I think, is quite important. Some, it's not necessarily a conversation that I have. You know, how are you, Mrs. Smith? Oh, uh, good. I'm valuing my relationships this month. You know, um, it's not like that. It, it, it's just as part of the ongoing visits and follow-up, and my sense that 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 life is actually very positive. And also, I think people take time to simplify um, and I think that that generates actually a lot of a good quality of life as well. Um, it may be a period where if patients haven't dabbled in complementary therapies or improved therapies before then that's the time when they might try you know special diets or vitamins or, or some sort of herbs. Um, specifically for men with prostate cancer um, in the, in, these are very common questions. Side effects, ongoing fatigue, sometimes hot flushes, um, diet, what do I do about my diet? Uh, exercise is not a question I get usually. Should I exercise? I'm telling them to exercise. And I know that I've just had a brief conversation with Rob Newton who will talk later today. Um, they don't ask me about it, I tell them to do it. But it's, it's very important for their bone health and their muscle strength, especially if they have ongoing treatment with, with hormones, for example. Um, men sometimes have questions about how frequently they should be seen. A am I being seen frequently enough? Should I see my doctors more frequently? How often should I have a PSA? What other tests should I, should I do? Et cetera, et cetera. Um, Sexual function is very important, but it's not a question that I get, except usually from, from the wife. Um, and I'm, it's possibly a reflection of, of the age where men get uh, prostate cancer, and so it's not necessarily a major concern anymore, especially if they've been through a harsh time with treatment, for example, 
I was also asked to talk about ovarian cancer. I don't see a whole lot of women with ovarian, ca ovarian cancer, although I have done my time. Um, and this, the issues are actually surprisingly similar. The side effects, ongoing fatigue, hot flushes. Um, some people call it, some women call it chemo brain, you know, they don't concentrate so well. A couple of years after therapy, they're still on follow-up. Uh, things are not quite gelling, they're not quite as organised. Um, diet, same questions. What sort of diet should I, should I have? Should I go on to buy a juicer? Should I extract juice, etc.? Again, it's not a question I get asked about, but I tell them anyhow. Exercise, it's very important. Monitoring frequency. In ovarian cancer, CA125 is a tumour marker that sometimes oncologists use to monitor the situation, but it's not as good as PSA, for example. Still, um, your oncologist may or may not mention that. Sexual function for some younger women that have ovarian cancer and have to have their ovaries taken out, for example, that's very important. Um, and also an underrepresented area of uh, thought, probably, and treatment is bone health. Um, a lot of women, if they lose their ovaries or suddenly become menopausal, um, bone health is often the last thing that, that is thought about, but that's where the exercise comes in and um, th that requires monitoring in my view. So just briefly about what sorts of new therapies are happening um, for both prostate cancer and ovarian cancer. It so happens that pro prostate cancer has been a very active area of um, research over the last five years or so and the FDA has approved about four or five new treatments in the last five years. One of these is a chemotherapy drug, cabazitaxel, but a couple of these are new hormone type agents. This is a, a radiation type treatment um, and this is actually a vaccine which is not yet available here because of its expense. In ovarian cancer there's been a lot of hit and miss unfortunately and we're still stuck with essentially chemotherapy because that is the most effective treatment. It's not for want of trying um, and in the US you can get a drug called Avastin which is an antibody that targets blood vessels. So some women can have that with their chemotherapy. And then just to finish up, some of the research that we've been doing, been kindly uh, funded over the last three years by the PCFA. Um, this is actually work done by um, Kieran Scott. Um, he's a scientist, basic scientist. He spent many years developing a, a, a novel compound. But the background to this is that as you know, prostate cancer is very commonly diagnosed in Australia and in the Western world. Um, and the chances of being diagnosed with prostate cancer increases with age. So if you're in the 70s, um, you probably have double the chance of being diagnosed with prostate cancer than if you're in the 60s, for example. Um, family history is not a particularly important risk factor, but it is a risk factor. Um, and uh, there's a lot of controversy about early detection and you, you may or may not be aware of some editorials and articles that have appeared in Australian journals and, and worldwide journals about PSA screening uh, and whether it's useful or not. I'm not going to buy into that. <laughs> not today anyhow. <laughs> now the background to the work that Kieran has done is that this is just some histopathology slides of prostate cancer. And you can see these, this is the normal staining that the pathologists have a look under the microscope and they can have a look at this particular structure which is a gland, a prostate gland, and this happens to be normal. Um, and this is a special stain for um, an enzyme, an enzyme called PLA2 or phospholipase A2. Um, and in normal tissue, um, you can see it barely staining. In someone with prostate cancer with abnormal and increased numbers of glands, you can see it staining stronger. And then in someone with, um, who's failed hormone treatment, you can see it staining stronger even still. So the PLA2 seems to reflect what is happening with, with the prostate cancer through treatments. 
this is the compound that he's developed. It's actually like a circle. Um, it's actually a protein. And just very briefly, these, this is a graph of mice, a group of mice that he's treated. And all of these mice have had prostate cancer cells implanted in them and they don't have an immune system, so the prostate cancers grow slowly and we can detect the size of the prostate cancer by measuring it on a regular basis. And this axis represents tumour volume, so basically that's the size of the prostate cancer, and this is time. So with time, the prostate cancer increases in size, not surprisingly, um, but then these mice were treated with varying doses of these cyclic peptides um, and you can see that over time, over weeks, in some of the mice they slowly, the prostate cancer slowly um, decreased in size and in some it was quite effective and, and in, in, those, in, in those few mice the cancer never reappeared. It was also a very well tolerated compound. So our, our plan at the moment is to submit this particular compound to a, uh, a first thymokinetic trial. This is not a proper trial. This is just to see how much of the stuff gets into men. So we need to take blood to assay it and see what concentrations we get to. So it's a very simple first pass trial, if you like. And that's in, um, in deliberation by the Ethics Committee at the moment. It's been manufactured by Switzerland and is due to sh be shipped to Sydney very soon. So hopefully, um, if we can show some preliminary evidence that we can give it to men, it gets absorbed, then further studies will need to be done in order to see the effectiveness of, of this particular compound once we've figured out um, how much of the dose that we need to. And of course, we'll need to continue applying for trials, uh, uh, ongoing funds and so on. So as I mentioned, Kieran Scott is the guy who's developed all of these compounds and it's his work here that I'm presenting today um, and some of these collaborators. I'd like to thank the Prostate Cancer Foundation for the funding. The Cancer Institute have given us some money for equipment. Um, University of S Western Sydney has given money for <coughs> salaries and uh, University of New South Wales has um, given us a grant for some equipment as well. Thank you. <coughs>so the question is about this particular trial of the the C2 compound and whether we're looking for men eventually we will be um, in fact the first target is is prostate cancer we think that it has relevance for other cancers as well um, but the basics need to be done first and, and yes we will be looking for volunteers and patients to go on these early studies um, to get some preliminary idea of what the side effects are and how well it's tolerated and of course to see whether the PSA drops. The, the, the usual process um, is that once the ethics committee passes the trial then we can start to, to recruit men um, and normally we can't advertise for a trial except with specific ethics committee permission so in this case it may be suitable to do that, but we would then need to ask the Ethics Committee to approve the advertisement. So the question is, uh, is Avastin available? And if it's not available, then how long will it take to get here? Avastin is available. It has been available for the last um, two or three years. It's made by Roche, but unfortunately it's not funded by the PBS for any cancers. Right. So it means that it's out of reach for, you know, exactly, yeah, 95% of people, yeah, it's very expensive. <laughs> the question is, what is the role of Avastin, um, how does it work? So Avastin is an antibody that targets blood vessels. So in, in order for any cancer to grow from this big to this big, it needs to be fed, just like anybody. Um, and the way it does that is to put out hormones and proteins to attract blood vessels to grow into it. 
so that the blood vessels get diverted, stolen if you like. And so tumours, in order to grow to you know, massive sizes, needs more and more blood vessels to feed it. So the Avastin targets the formation of those blood vessels and stops them. It doesn't actually kill the cancer cells. It works around it. So theoretically, if that was the only thing driving cancer growth, you could stop a cancer at this size forever, as long as nothing else mutated or caused it to grow. So the question is, is C2 just a trial in Australia or, or is the rest of the world being involved? Uh, with any drug development, usually it starts small and then it gets bigger. So that's why it takes years. So the usual process is you've got to, to define the best dose at which to give it. And then once you've done that, you pick your target cancer. It could be 50 people with brain cancer or 50 people with lung cancer. And then you study that drug at that dose for effectiveness. So out of those 50 patients, how many respond to treatment? And what are the side effects at that particular dose? And then once you get an idea of that, then um, a phase three trial is done. A phase three trial is a comparative study. And then that's when you need hundreds, often possibly even thousands of patients to go on it. And that's when it becomes worldwide. So having shown that your drug is effective, drug A, is it better? The question is, is it better than what we've got at the moment? Is it better than drug B? So that's where the comparison is usually. And at the end of that, you have your statistics to show that it's this much better than drug B. And then the drug company usually push, pushes, uh, submits it to, for approval um, to the regulatory bodies like the FDA in America, for example. And then it's approved, you know, and then it's available. So the question is, what's the typical timeline of that drug development process I just described? It varies a lot on the drug. There's a little bit of marketing involved as well, and I'm speaking out of school here. We're, bet we're amongst friends, aren't we? we are. <laughs> uh, if you've got a drug that works really well, but in a small population of patients, then um, you can fast track that process because you can, you can demonstrate that, uh, that your drug is only applicable to that small population of patients and it's not going to ever be used for 80 or 90 percent. Then you can fast track it and say, okay, well, these patients are hard to find. Can we get approval earlier? Can we get approval based on our phase two findings? In other words, um, if it's so effective, we think there's a, an ethical and moral obligation to, to make it available to, to patients as early as possible. So sometimes those arguments win the day in the regulatory bodies. So that has happened for some drugs. But for a lot of drug companies, they try and target a broader population of patients, which means then you have to show that your drug is better than the next drug or what is available, in which case that phase three study could take a number of years. So typically it could be anything from you know, two or three years for that small population, uh, unique population study, to, to maybe eight years um, f from go to woe. And then of course there's an extra step in Australia. Once the FDA approves it, it means the drugs can be available in the US, but then it has to be submitted through our TGA and then through our committees and then has to be approved onto the PBS, which can often take another couple of years on top of that as well.